Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm joined by Harvey Mansfield, Harvard professor. And Good author. to be here. Good to be here again. Thank Good to you. have you back. Um, so we're speaking in early April. Judge Gorsuch is about to be confirmed by the United States Senate as the Supreme Court Justice. Mm -hmm. And you were you. Um, I'm supposed to watch the hearings and comment on these things on TV, right. but of course I didn't and just depended on summaries. But you actually went to the trouble of watching. Yes, I went to the trouble of watching and very glad for it too. It was a real drama, and uh, if if someone wanted to study American politics, uh, I don't think you could find a better thing to look at, event, uh, done as this was. So it was a hearing, and uh, each senator spoke uh, in alternation, Republicans and Democrats, and they, at the end of it, had worked up the, a very good case, each for its own uh, party and its own position. These people are not intellectuals, they're not professors, they're not experts, but they did a very good job of, um, of presenting each, each party's view um, on the level that uh, most people who are in politics or interested in politics can, can understand. So it was, it was really, uh, it was really impressive. And this was all on C-SPAN. It's better to go to C-SPAN than to watch it on the networks. Right. The networks interrupt with commercials, and they also have commentary. It's better to see it without commentary. C-SPAN only tells you the names of the people that, and something of the procedures that are going right. on. But uh, here was a big event which turned out to be a, a, a lesson in politics. You were learning from people who are actually in politics what, what was uh, going on and what was the uh, issue that was involved. And most generally, one could say, the issue was uh, what's the relationship between law and politics? And two parties have uh, quite different views uh, on the Supreme Court. So Senator Grassley, it was Charles Grassley from Iowa, was the uh, chairman of the of the relevant Senate committee uh, began, and he um, he spoke of the people. Uh, the Supreme Court, this seemingly undemocratic institution, uh, is actually an instrument of the people, and which was an argument that was originally made by Alexander Hamilton in right. Federalist 78. You can look it up. Uh, and um, it, it still had its power for him. So the people make the Constitution, and that uh, directly by uh, um, ratifying uh, originally and now by uh, living under it and uh, enjoying the opportunity to amend it when they wish. So the, uh, that gives the Constitution a greater authority than the legislature or Congress. Congress consists of representatives, not the people themselves. And so the representatives may get it wrong, and the court is needed to call the representatives to account in that case, using as a standard uh, the people's uh, constitution. So that means that uh, there are really two laws in America. One is the law that's passed by Congress. Of course, that affects you and you have to obey. But then uh, the other is the law of the constitution. The Constitution is not just a document, but um, it is a uh, law that was put in the, uh, that's uh, a very strong statement by Justice Marshall right, right. at the beginning of the history of the Supreme Court, and uh, that continues to, to flourish. So uh, with us, the rule of law is complicated by the fact of um, uh, of the diff distinction between the two kinds of law, one above the other, but the other, the one, the inferior law, the congressional law, is also the one that uh, actually applies and has sanctions to it. If, uh, if you disobey the law, something bad happens to you. Whereas uh, <laughs> if you disobey the Constitution, uh, well, that's what the court uh, works right. on and decides, always in the name of the people. So that's, um, that was uh, Grassley's main point, the, um, the authority of the Supreme Court. And uh, that involves the separation of powers, uh, which uh, 
um, he and, uh, and then a li little bit later, uh, uh, Senator Hatch, Orrin Hatch from Utah, uh, emphasized separation of powers is uh, is a, in a, a, a sterling original principle of the Constitution, which the court is bound to maintain. Separation of powers means that uh, each power is independent of the others, and yet made dependent so that it on the others so that its independence <laughs> doesn't uh, permit it to uh, encroach upon the others power so um, the Supreme Court is in a way the supreme institution in American politics and yet uh, it's checked by this very uh, proceeding uh, the fact that uh, the right. president appoints them and Congress or the Senate gets to uh, advise and consent to their to, to his nominations, and so, um, so you, we were. If you look at this, you have to understand that you are getting a view of American politics, politics from the standpoint of the Supreme Court, as it comes through the Senate. So the senators were all more political in their talk than Judge Gorsuch was right. in his answers. He was talking like a judge; they were talking like politicians and um, the, so that was and the fact that there is this separation of powers means that uh, each of the th powers has its own point of view and um, that means that um, uh, th th that um, th that point of view is um, uh, is pushed or promoted by the party that holds that branch Right. So when uh, the Republicans have the Congress, uh, they speak in favor of the powers of Congress, and the same with the presidency, or, or the not quite the Supreme Court, to the to, at least not to that same extent. So there's a, this means that in, in addition to your party, you've also got the power of the branch that you push, and this kind of means that there is always a kind of built-in constitutional hypocrisy in American politics, that um, the, the two parties are pushing the power of Congress or the presidency, depending on whether they hold right. that, um, that particular power. And it's in their interest, obviously, to push the power of the, of the branches that they hold. So, uh, uh, so, so, so parties go back and forth in their uh, devotion or their, to uh, to the to a particular branch. Now then, uh, after Grassley spoke, uh, we had uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein from uh, California. She was uh, all politics. Uh, Grassley and Hatch were all law, and um, she was all politics. And of course, she began, and so did most of the Democrats who had with the fact that this was a very political event, right. that um, Merrick Garland had been um, nominated by President Obama, and um, here was, uh, um, and, and, and the Senate had uh, really, in an unprecedented move, uh, refused to uh, even hold hearings on, on Garland's uh, nomination, uh, saying that uh, the election would be a kind of, uh, mandate right. as, as to uh, whether a Republican or a Democrat should be the next uh, Supreme Court justice to, to um, replace Justice Scalia, who had died. So, uh, so, so, so they were full of indignation. It was wonderful to see that <laughs> and yeah. to listen to it. Uh, they had got a windfall in Scalia's death, something they weren't expecting. Or, but we're still very happy to get, and suddenly it had been snatched out of their right. possession and given back to, uh, to the other party so that uh, the Republicans could make good on the, on the death of uh, one of their, actually the mainstay of the Repu on the Republican side, or the conservative side in the, in the Supreme Court. Plus they expected to win the election, as most people expected yes. Hillary Clinton to win. So I think if they, That's right. it was even a, though they were yeah. angry about Garland, they kind of assumed they would end up with a Democratic yes. yeah. nominated justice. And right. That was a shock It to might them. have been Garland himself. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, uh, and Senator McConnell, McConnell who, who worked out this strategy, <laughs> um, didn't even hold hearings. I think he was perhaps afraid that uh, uh, Garland might be rather good, rather yes, impressive, so, yeah. just as Gorsuch turned out to right. be in, uh, in his replies. So, so, so it's better not to let the side, other side make their case in, in the most favorable circumstances. And uh, so, that, so we took a gamble, you're right, and, uh, but he didn't have anything to lose. Yeah, yeah. Democrats had plenty to lose yes. and they lost it. Yes. So, Trump, doesn't, Trump doesn't give McConnell, if I can say President Trump, doesn't give Leader McConnell enough credit for <laughs> providing this great opportunity for him. You know, the much derided Republican establishment in Washington that allegedly can't do anything. Mm -hmm. This was a case where the McConnell held yeah. 54 senators, some of whom were under pressure to go yeah. along with, with yeah. Garland and at least give him a hearing, as you say, yeah. which was sort of unprecedented. Yeah. It's impressive what McConnell did. Yeah. Uh, Would we want to say that, uh, that McConnell helped Trump get elected? Yeah, yeah. May, may making the court more of a visible issue, you think? Yes, and uh, be, many Republicans, it seemed, came to Trump uh, towards the end of the campaign and, right. and voted for him on this issue. Yeah. So, yeah. So yes, they're, they're the Republican is Anyway, so this was a very political occasion. Right. And here were all these Republican senators pretending that they were putting up this impartial fellow who, right. <laughs> who, was, uh, who me kind of thing. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. and so they were, they, it was very, very partisan. It was a kind of partisan triumph, you might say, for the, for the Republicans. And, but uh, but the Democrats put up a good, good, uh, Good debate, and, um, and 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 certainly made their points. Their points were that uh, the Supreme Court is really a political institution, and um, you can see that from the fact that there are many issues on which political issues on which that is it has pronounced, like gun control, abortion, you know, environment, campaign finance. All these uh, are are very um, contested political issues and the court was right in the middle of them. How can you say that uh, law is up here and politics is over there? That doesn't seem to make sense. So, And the court often dividing between Republican appointees and Democratic appointees, which also yeah. suggests it's somewhat political. <laughs> it does. It does indeed. It says it's uh, polarized, like the rest of our politics. Right. Not always, but uh, sometimes uh, conservatives divide. I think a little oftener than right. than the uh, than the liberals. But um, yes, it, uh, it it seems in that way quite partisan. So that suggests, I think. Um, the fact that there are these two ways of looking at the Constitution, and this came out very much in the in the um, debate. So, uh, the Democrats were saying uh, Gorsuch is not in the mainstream of American politics, but what they meant was he wasn't a mainstream liberal, because I think it turns out that we have uh, we have two mainstreams: a conservative one and a liberal one. And, and um, the, the liberal one says that um, the Constitution is a living Constitution, and that was a phrase that they invented by a progressive, I think, in the 19, early 1920s. A living Constitution, uh, meaning uh, organic. This is the great point of Woodrow Wilson, that the Constitution is, should be understood not as a mechanical uh, instrument or mechanism, uh, as kind of with counteracting powers, right. so much as an organic one. And he was thinking in terms of uh, the theory of evolution. So to live means to evolve. Uh, circumstances change in your life and you have to react and make uh, adjustments or changes uh, which, are, which correspond to the new facts. So the uh, America has become more of a democracy, so it's the business of the Supreme Court to um, encourage or at least endorse this greater movement toward more and more democracy in the sense of equality. 
So the, uh, the, the Supreme Court should be a progressive institution. It should uh, teach people that we need and should um, bless greater equality than, than we have. And, th and that is the way which we are, in which we are most surely ourselves. And uh, the, uh, to do this, the, the, the court must uh, have a kind of empathy for those who profit the most from greater equality. And those who profit the most are the most vulnerable parts of uh, our country. And um, so uh, the, the government should take as its primary goal the, the, the suckering and, and improving promoting of those who are most vulnerable. So they're brought into the whole of, of our country. I think um, the whole, is, the equality is not so much the end in itself as an instrument to the end of making a, a whole. Everybody is to be included. So the Democrats often speak of inclusiveness as, as, their, as their goal. And, 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 it's, and so this is, this is a way in which the Constitution must live by um, responding in the mode of evolution. Uh, in, and in a way, of course, Darwin's theory is uh, a theory of survival, right. that each species uh, survives by, uh, um, by making these adjustments to a new environment. And uh, here it's, it's more than survival, it's survival as, uh, as a whole. Our, our country must be made a whole in which everyone feels um, e equally involved and equally respected. So, but on the other hand, uh, you have the Republican point of view, which is, uh, um, has been called originalism, and right. Scalia had a, a lot to do with uh, the, the formulation and, and uh, promotion of that, uh, of that idea, originalism, that uh, what is the Constitution uh, if it isn't a way, a fixed way of proceeding, and um, so that uh, it, it, what it is is requires you to be faithful to what it was when it was first made and for the purposes that it was first made. That raises a question as to whether original means uh, literally uh, original and that the text right. is an absolute Bible that you, but even the Bible has to be interpreted so, so that the text is an, an absolute uh, um, authority that, that um, can't be uh, questioned, or uh, is it a principle, like the principle of the separation of powers? And so, uh, an example would be of of something that must be changed, uh, even according to Republicans, uh, is the fact that uh, the Constitution doesn't. It mentions the Army and Navy, but mm. not the Air Force. <laughs> We didn't have, for some reason, we didn't have an air force in the 18th century, and, but now we do. And so the president, uh, is, it seems, has is given his power over the armed forces includes that, even though it's not mentioned. So that would be an example of how you can't quite be simply literal. Right. Yeah. So 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 this is uh, this, and this is put up against uh, the progressive notion. And it depends on a, on a distinction between uh, um, the fixed original law and the changeable congressional laws. And, um, are, and which requires a certain distance between uh, the political context and the uh, constitutional framework, which is also a context larger context um, and that there's all kinds of difficulties and so on uh, as as uh, as the country goes on it passes laws and those laws are are put up to the Supreme Court to see whether they match the um, the Constitution or not and really is the the question is uh, uh, is this law required for or permitted by 
a free way of life? Can you have a free society and, um, and, for, exa and for example, not, and not have a right of abortion? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so when the, when the court looks on, on that, it, it tends to, uh, that type of question, it, t it tends to pick one side or the other. And that means that the Constitution sort of acquires more substance. Right. Originally, the Constitution seems to be purely procedural. It tells you how to do things. It doesn't you know, tell you, except in the most general terms, what your goals should be. You know, more perfect union, prosperity, and so on, and freedom. But um, um, as, as it goes on, and so this, this is uh, obviously what's called precedent that uh, the Constitution becomes the Constitution plus precedent. Right. And you can change precedent. Uh, so sometimes the, the liberals want to change precedent right. in order to make the Constitution uh, more living, more alive, more relevant. And the con conservatives want to change it in order to go back against the uh, progressive changes to something which, which came before. And so uh, that the, the the, 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 you could say the, the procedural aspect of, or the precedent aspect of, of, um, of the judiciary uh, complicates the uh, whole question of law and politics by adding substance to the Constitution. I suppose that you could say also that in your original distinction of the Constitution up here and the laws down here, so to speak, constitutional law is the middle ground or the precedent that yes. gets fought over that where the fights then take place in a yeah. sense. And conservatives have a slight, uh, you know, prefer the Constitution to constitutional law uh, in a way or want it to That's be true. more anchored in the Constitution. That's true. Liberals right. seem to right. prefer constitutional law to the Constitution sometimes. That if is, if it's yeah, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah. And so this partisan split, um, I guess I have two questions. You can uh, mm. one is: Do you prefer one or the other? One or the other of these views better for the country, or is it a healthy dynamic between the two? And relatedly, I guess I would say this: I was struck in Washington, you know, the conventional kind of uh, commentary I would say on the hearings uh, and on the whole process of the Supreme Court nomination is: It's too bad it's so partisan. You know, in the old days, they didn't have such partisan fights, which is true to some degree over Supreme Court justices. And if only you could get back to a more you know, respect for good judges and all that. But it seems to me you actually like rather, or either you <laughs> like or you think it's inevitable, the, the partisan fight, and you think there's something educational uh, about it as well. So you're not a critic of the, of the Democrats all voting really against Gorsuch and the Republicans voting for him. That's kind of a, a dynamic that uh, teaches you something about, yeah. That that law is not as impartial or universal as, uh, wants, as it wants to be, or as the people <laughs> who are in charge of the law at present want it to be. Right, either yeah. party, presumably, yeah. Right. No, no I, I, I prefer the original Constitution, and that's, but that's partly because I think it's much, the people who made it are more intelligent than we are. Right. right. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, if you wanted to study the American, uh, American politics and the American Constitution, you should, go to the Federalist above all, uh, f first and uh, foremost. And, uh, and, and, and so, uh, and I, now I also think there is a certain uh, uh, inadequacy to the progressive notion of greater and greater equality. Right. There needs to be, um, uh, uh, democracy is not improved by always making it more and more democratic in the sense of more and more equal. There are human inequalities, too, that need to be respected and given their due. And, and, and so just a, a headlong rush um, with, without really considering the consequences, without looking to uh, any, um, um, any um, in, uh, situation in which we would have had enough progress. Progress is progress if it's getting if things are getting better and better. And uh, you, you would, wouldn't call it progress unless it was surely irreversible, because then you might fall back. Right. So it's, uh, is, is it really 
possible is it, it, it even a good idea that we never reconsider what we once called progress. Right. So uh, it would seem that a free society would want to have the choice uh, whether to do that. And, and, uh, and the Democrats, uh, with their progressivism, um, aren't sure of where they want to stop. You, know? you can only call it progress if you know what's uh, worth stopping at or where you should, should stop, where is what is good. You know? if, yeah, progress will be getting closer and closer to what is good. So progressivism shouldn't be something that's sim simply uh, infinite and unending. Uh, it, it needs to know, maybe more knowing of, more cognizant of, of, of the limits t to progressivism. So I, I think that would be the general criticism I would make of, of the democratic point of view. But this tension between originalism and progressivism, or whatever, one wants, is, yeah, it's, it's not going away. It's not going to go away. No, that's and uh, nor should it, I guess. Yes, yeah, nor should it. Want. Our democracy is something uh, essentially progressive, but it 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 it, it, it has trouble st sitting still, and <laughs> it's, it's it's restless, and it's, it needs to move. So change, change, change. That's going to be a recurring theme of our our politics doesn't always amount to much. Maybe that's good, too. But, right. but still, it's, uh, yeah. uh, if it's not good, it's inevitable. <laughs> so uh, so where I'm, and I think that our parties are going to continue pretty much as they are. There's always going to be a conservative party and a, and a progressive one. And Gorsuch himself, you've spoken about the senators more than about him. Are there lessons to be learned just from his his replies, his manner of conducting himself. You, yeah. yeah yes, he, I, I, he did very well. He, uh, he's intelligent, but not too intelligent. Right. He didn't. <laughs> he didn't, didn't show off. To, he yeah. didn't show off. He didn't try to explain things too deeply. Uh, that's see. That, that's where the senators were so good. They, they, uh, they always they gave good examples, things that people understand. And uh, so, so he, in, in, but he, uh, Gorsuch knew not to, to be too much the constitutional lawyer. And, um, and, and, and of course, he set himself up as a man of great propriety. Right. Who would, uh, who would uh, n never be uh, disturbed or influenced by anything uh, in, unjudicial. So, very impartial. And I think a little bit contemporary in the is sort of, you know, very fair and judicious and not quite the spirit of Bork or Scalia, the two really great originators, you might say, of, yes. of the point of view that, not originators, yeah. but revivers maybe, of the point of view that Gorsuch more or less holds, but no. uh, not, not really. You know, he writes well, but there are no barbs. Yeah. No. No, he doesn't take shots at people or I sort things. of miss that in Scalia. Uh, yes. And I'm not sure we'll ever have a justice like Scalia again, though, because it's yeah, not, perhaps uh, not, uh, right. not rewarded for that. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good to have a rather belligerent person on your side sometimes. Yeah. But uh, he's Especially not, at the he's, founding, maybe, of this, at the beginning. Gonna, <laughs> right. He's not going to be that. So, but, but maybe the, that has its virtues, too. And generally, yeah. on, so there was a and what struck me just reading about it a little, it does remind Americans of the rule of law. I mean, yeah, whether yes. from a sort of progressive point of view or a yes, right, a conservative point of yes, view. Yes, that's right. In both cases, it's law. That's true. And is yeah. that a? And in both cases, that's it, questionable. Well, yes. Yeah, so talk, talk, talk about that a little <laughs> so bit. So now, let, now let's go, let's talk a little bit about Aristotle and his uh, and his view. This is he didn't even, come up. He didn't this, come up. He that didn't much come in the up. Hearing. I don't think he was mentioned, right? <laughs> and uh, certainly not commented on. Yes, uh, so uh, maybe there's something, a constitution which is even more original than our constitution. And, and, that, and, that is, uh, and that is a kind of question mark which Aristotle raises in his uh, Politics in Book Three. There's a chapter on the question whether is it better to be ruled by the best man or by the best laws. So even if you could get the best, the most perfect laws, 
would that be better than the best man? And so, so uh, law, it seems, in, the, in, in his argument, in Aristotle's argument, is, is uh, as a virtue and a defect. The virtue is that it's impartial. It um, doesn't have passion in it. It states uh, what you must and must not do, but it doesn't express uh, indignation or anger. Uh, and because uh, it's impartial, it applies to everything. So even though it may be, say, passed, a certain law might be passed because of a terrible murder that brought up and, and that wasn't adequately cared for in the, in the previous law, still it, it, it doesn't atta attack that particular person or that criminal or that uh, event by itself, but describes it in universal terms, So, which means uh, it, it cools down. It, and then cools down. It's, that's why it's better to have a law than lynching. Yeah. Lynching is passionate. But a rule of law is um, slows you down, makes you follow a procedure, makes you identify and give proof. So, uh, so that makes the law impartial. But the trouble with impartial is that it's also abstract. So, in, to, in order to be impartial, it has to be universal. It has to set a, a state of rational category of crime and criminal. And um, but then, to do that, it has to uh, abstract from particular cases that don't quite fit the universal. And that's where the best man would come in. The man with the most prudence would be able to see where the law is too harsh or too lenient and, uh, and act uh, prudently and accordingly. And well, the trouble with that is that the more you do that, um, uh, the more you enthrone the idea of prudence rather than law. And also, uh, when you exercise your prudence to evade or to get around or to make an exception in the law, uh, you set a precedent. And uh, if, it, if the same or similar uh, difficulty arises again, then you uh, have to do what you did before in the same circumstances. So you tend to recreate the whole idea of law that you're first questioning. Uh, so, and prudent, prudence, in other words, becomes a kind of law of its own. And uh, at, the, at the end, after you've made all these exceptions, uh, you want to get back to the ease and the, and the seeming justice of, uh, of a law. So you can isolate, oscillate between uh, uh, perfect prudence and perfect legality, and neither position is, uh, is tenable. So this is in Aristotle, and so what he's, uh, what he's he, he, he wants uh, the, the rule of prudence, but it has to be th through, through law. So a wise man, uh, if he had, could give full expression to his wisdom, would be a king and run everything on his own because, because of his terrific wisdom. He would always know the best thing to do, and he would always know the best way to do it. Um, but still, uh, he would accept this uh, limitation on his rule, on, on the rule of wisdom um, in the form of law or customary law. He, he, in his wisdom, would accept limits on his wisdom. And uh, so and that's kind of the fundamental prudence, which you can say is behind a, a constitution. It's a sort of living prudence. You need the reminder that law is not perfect. Uh, as now Justice Gorsuch sort of gave the impression that law is perfect. Right. There's nothing. And the best uh, judge would be the most impartial judge. But uh, so the Democrats have a certain point when they object to this and say, well, you have to look at the consequences. Uh, how is this going to hurt people? Right. Yeah. How is, how is this going to affect 
Um, uh, so, so uh, uh, I wouldn't call that empathy. I would call that prudence. Right. <laughs> yeah. Empathy is a kind of feeling uh, which uh, uh, can often be irrational. This gives you a sympathy to somebody who's hurting, but uh, maybe he's hurting for a good reason. Um, you have to use your prudence, your reason to to uh, to discipline your empathy. So I, you know, em em empathy is a little too loose. I think from, and I, I believe Aristotle would say, but but still, the, what's behind it, the idea behind it is that law is not perfect. And I suppose this uh, role for prudence or wisdom is sort of smuggled into the American constitutional system, primarily through the president and the executive, who does have discretion and some prerogative even. Yes, and, right. And in this yeah. is instance, in a way, nicely manifested in the fact that the president has to select a particular individual to be a Supreme Court justice, yeah. so it is a judgment of, there's no law that would tell you that it should be Gorsuch rather than John right. Smith. That's a judgment of a... It's an individual prudential judgment of Donald Trump. Right, well, yeah. <laughs> As it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, so... <laughs> that kind of well, knowledge the, the, Of course, the president isn't elected on the basis that he's the wisest man that we have. Right. But, but uh, still, so, so for whatever wisdom he has, um, we take advantage of, um, but also with a check. This, the Senate does get to advice and consent right. with a check um, in the in the but So that in the system, in a way, embodies both the, the nominating of the particular yes. individual. But then yeah, the yeah. In, in general, the Constitution has, has room for what is extra-constitutional, right. what is outside the Constitution, the necessities that, that arise and must be met quickly Emergencies. So, um, Foreign policy. government government yeah. isn't only policy; it's also scrambling right. in in uh, in, in uh, dire situations. And particular choices of particular individuals, both yes. for the cabinet and the courts. The yes, all, all of that. That's uh, not just relegated to some no. rule, you know. Yeah. Right. Nor do we give it to a committee, right? So that's you know, a commission of some kind, commission that's empowered to pick out smart people. Yeah. Right. Some states do that, do in a way a version of that, right? They yeah. It's a list of judges that can be appointed, that mm -hmm. given to the governor or whatever, but the, America, the, the national, the federal constitution, I think, leans against that pretty strong, leans towards a strong right. president using his individual judgment to yeah. pick good individuals, right? So, it's, it's, so all in all, I would encourage uh, everybody to, uh, to become a fan of C-SPAN. Okay. And uh, watch the hearings. To watch it. Uh, yeah, you can. I mean, you don't have to become a, uh, an, you know, an, an actual uh, a fan in the sense of, uh, of, of bound to it and feel obliged to. It does sort of pick you up and catch you uh -huh. and take you along. But so there are limits to that. Um, but still, uh, it, you know, it, it rewards. It's very rewarding and, and, and to see your. Uh, your government at work makes it feel as if it belongs to you a little bit more than if you don't know anything and just read the results in the newspaper and magazines. Well, that's good. That's yeah. that's heartening in a day where we probably need a little yeah. heartening and a reminder of yeah. citizenship and self-government right. as opposed to merely watching the spectacle. Right? So, yeah. yeah. They're your congressmen, your yeah. your senators at least, uh, yeah. representing people in different states, asking these questions and. Yeah. Yeah. So and doing a pretty good job, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, on that note, thank you for this conversation about the Gorsuch hearing. Thanks. Its My pleasure. And, yeah. uh, and thanks for joining us on Conversations.